at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. So this is the XY Life Forum. It's a bit of an experiment. Uh, we, the aim of it is we just want to have a bit more of an intellectual conversation where we're not interviewing someone and hearing about their uh, experiences. It's just more of a discussion with the community. Uh, long term, we're looking at you know getting others involved and, and trying to... Uh, you know, bring that uh, Facebook discussion into a, you know, a longer form video discussion. Uh, so people, uh, if you've got questions, throw them out, discuss in the chat box, um, make sure you set it to everyone uh, because we want this to be a really collaborative uh, forum. So to kick us off, I'll just go through who we've got uh, today. We've got Clayton Daniels. He's a former advisor, author of How to Fund Your Ideal Lifestyle and a strategist at XY Advisor. So welcome, Clayton. G'day. And we've also got Naomi Christopher, Senior Brand Manager at Midwinter, All Round Superstar and Head of Communications <laughs> at XY Advisor. Hello, everybody. And we've got our regular Benny Nash as well, Financial Advisor at Pivot Wealth, licensed with a boutique firm and Head of Operations at XY Advisor. Hello, everyone. Hipster Advisor. And we've got Adrian Paddy, Financial Advisor at AP Financial Solutions, licensed with AMP, Director of Spark Professional, uh, a training and recruitment firm for financial advisors, and CEO and big boss of XY Advisor. Hi, guys. <laughs> and myself, Phil Thompson, I'm a financial advisor with Thompson Financial Services, and I'm licensed with Synchron, uh, and I, my title is Head Troublemaker at XY Advisor. So today we're talking about going beyond the SOA. <laughs> we're going beyond the SOA. So uh, we're doing a live event at the end of this month, the 30th of March in Sydney. So if you're not in Sydney, um, book your flights now. Uh, you can all stay at Paddy's house, um, which I think I'm going to be. Um, so it's going to be a great event. Uh, we've got Clayton Daniels. We've got Mia Taylor um, from Evalesco and we've got Mark Nagel um, from Traster Wealth Management coming and talking to us about what they're doing to go beyond the SOA. And today we're going to be talking about it and it really there's two kind of aspects for me when we talk about going beyond the SOA. It's number one, it's talking about, you know, focusing on that client experience more so than focusing on the actual piece of paper or the document that we need to give our clients. And the other aspect of going beyond the SOA is uh, moving away from actual financial product advice completely. How do we no longer do SOAs and if it is possible? So to start us off with a discussion about moving away completely from financial product advice is Clayton Daniels. He hasn't been quiet about moving out of financial <laughs> advice. Um, and he's written a few articles in IFA. And one of the quotes that I liked that he, that he wrote was says, uh, because traditional product providers haven't moved quickly enough, it's financial advisors who are going to suffer. And the longer advisors are handcuffed to dealing only in traditional products, the worse it will be. So Clayton, let us know why you've moved out of financial advice um, and what's your philosophy around financial product advice? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first things first, Phil. Uh, there's no plural on the Daniel, so uh, it's just Clayton Daniel. I just, I just, there's not, there's not several of me. It's just, just the one and only. So uh, I'll let you get away with it this time and this time only. Um, okay, so yeah, financial product. It's 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 interesting because advisors have a real love and hate relationship with product. Right, we need it to do what we want to do, um, but it doesn't quite provide everything that we would like it to do for our clients. So we have a very much an emotional uh, connection and relationship with a client and we want a certain amount of things that we can do for our client. And if that's limited simply because um, these big Goliath companies have, um, you know, limitations in what they choose to provide. And I put choose there because you, I mean, there's money there. There's, there's a lot of people in there. They, they can do a lot, but they choose not to. They choose to, 
to do things that's disengaging for the client. And I think that's because the entire business model has been very successful by disengaging people. So the less that they're involved, the less likely they are to make a move. And traditionally, financial advice has been, uh, you know, get the people in where we want them. Um, and as long as we sort of placate to that baseline of what is expected, then they just shut up and sit in the corner, you know, like um, that's kind of the opposite of where advice is going. And because of that, um, what we're doing here with XY is, is making a difference and it's awesome. But at the end of the day, it's changing um, an establishment and an incumbent position from the inside. And that's what we're doing here at XY. But um, I am a little bit restless. Uh, and so because of that, I've decided to, I wouldn't say exit financial advice. So I'm going to absolutely sit just on the perimeter of, of advice. And my next steps is I'll be trying to plan on bringing uh, things that to, to fill in those gaps that I see exist. But that's basically my view is that advice is heading in one direction. Um, and currently there's not a product to provide what we as advisors, and I say we, but knowing full well that I'm not an advisor anymore, uh, but uh, what we would like for clients to have currently doesn't exist. Um, and I see there being a bit of a, a bit of a, an agitation. Yeah. So, I mean, really the regulatory guides just say that you need to provide an SOA if you're doing financial product advice. That's all, it, that's all it really states. So, um, and, uh, Nobby just, just said product should come second, uh, and a in a financial plan. Um, so can you not just separate them and still be licensed under a, an AFSL or you just don't think that they can be aligned? No, absolutely. And that, and that's what I was doing. And I'm sure that's what a lot of people do. And, and of course it, it comes second. Um, and all those things exist. And I, I don't think the solution is for, you know, on mass, what I did in, in leaving, um, the job description behind. I don't, I don't think that that is the solution. It was the solution for me because of what I want to do. But, um, I, I would say everyone's still experiencing the problems that I was experiencing, which is um, we want to come in and we want to do all this stuff that just makes the financial life of our clients' lives better, right? So that is the purpose of a financial planner. Um, but we're, we're so handcuffed to what you can do and what you can't do. It, it's ridiculous. But now that I'm not a financial advisor in, anymore, I, I can do a lot more. So I can go um, and do an interview with news.com.au now and say, hey, you know what? Go, go deposit a hundred bucks a week in salary sacrifice, right? A and that's going to be pretty good advice for the majority of people. And then of course, in, in the article, it's don't go over your caps though, because you can get in trouble. But as an advisor, even though we all just go, oh well, yeah, I mean, that's 80% that's going to work for most people. Um, advisors can't do that. And, and it's just so much, so much of that stuff, that, that handcuffing that really annoys me. Um, and so while, you know, while XY is doing an excellent job with advisors, eventually we're going to have to get involved in legislation. Eventually we're going to have to get involved in, in product creation to really turn, um, the direction of where financial advice has been going since it's since it started yeah so i mean you meant you just mentioned legislation i've pulled another quote out of your article i've done my homework mate um <laughs> it said governments issue new laws which are then interpreted interpreted by asic who scare the dealer groups into creating frankenstein monsters of the original intention uh, so i'll throw this one over to ben nash but then you know clay said ultimately the advisors left with additional requirements that don't fit what the government set out to do in the first place so Nashi, you've been involved with, you know, we just talked about four different licensees over the last, you know, five or six years. So where do you think licensees kind of play in this space, moving away from SOAs? Yeah, look, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a difficult thing for, for the licensees and, and really with the, the framework, the way that it's set, it's, it's 
almost the, the purpose of the licensee for ASIC is to make it easy for them to enforce their laws. The purpose, you know, for, for advisors, you, you need to, obviously you need to have a license, but, you know, potentially there could be a better outcome there in advisors being licensed directly through ASIC. However, the administration that would be involved in doing something like that makes it, you know, not attractive to the, to the regulators. So it's likely that we continue, you know, with the framework as it stands. Um, as you mentioned, though, I think that, you know, the, the, the licensees, are, they're, they're on the hook for the advice that the that advisors provide. So in, in many cases, uh, you know, their frameworks and the, the guidance and, and their mandates to their advisors is to, is to cover themselves and, and, and ensure that their liability uh, is reduced. Now, that being said, there are a number of progressive licensees that fully, you know, recognise the um, the that fact and, and are trying to make their their uh, lives easier of the of the uh, of their advisors. You know, the, I know that your license with Synchron, I used to be licensed with them as well. They've done a great job in, I think, in you know, interpreting the the guidance provided by ASIC in a very straightforward way that makes it easier for advisors to to run their businesses. You know, things like simplifying statements of advice and. Um, just making it really clear, I still remember the first conversation that I had with Don Trapnell, um, and he said that he said to me before this is just just before I joined Synchron that he felt that uh, it, it would reach a point where advisors are sued for uh, and, and held responsible because of the fact that their clients can't understand the advice that they're getting, and you know there's so many. I used to be licensed with other co other companies, and you know, we would have 100, 150 page statements of advice. And there's no way that, you know, the, the even a 30 page statement of advice is difficult for someone to understand, let alone when you're just throwing in disclosure after disclosure after disclosure. Um, too difficult for people to understand. And, uh, you know, I think that that's something that we talked about in XY Advisor in, in the past as well, in terms of, you know, if we could change these sorts of things or, or had a mind to, how would we change it? And I think that more disclosure is not the answer. That that doesn't solve things because it's it's actually it's just easy to just disclose disclose away everything. And what you end up with is a watered down statement of facts and information that doesn't really you know provide the sort of direction that I think our clients need and deserve to get from getting a financial plan in place. So um, yeah, I think it's a, it's definitely a tricky space. But there are more you know. Um, I've recently moved more down the, the self-licensed path with the Wealth Network, uh, which is a very boutique uh, licensee. We've, we've just got three businesses licensed where I'm a part owner of the of, of the Wealth Network. And they're, they're another another licensee. They're embracing this same uh, same methodology to help make the, you know, find that right balance between, uh, you know, the advisor obligations and making sure the clients are covered but doing it in, in a straightforward way. Uh, as well, and I think you know the more that the more that advisors focus away from the the traditional things, as Clayton mentioned, you know, advisors are um, there's so many things that we want to do to drive the outcomes that we want for our clients outside of what is just a traditional product. Um, I think there will need to be more focus, but I also think that when you go down that path and do things properly, you, the the liability on the licensee. Um, is is reduced in a long way through effective coaching of clients. And I think, you know, if I look at the, the, the sort of advice work that we do with clients now, and call it advice or coaching the whole thing all together, all we're really doing is helping our clients make their own decisions. We're just facilitating a conversation with them and helping them understand the advantages and disadvantages of going down, you know, choosing different strategies or choosing different product solutions or choosing different investments. Um, so when you, I think when you do that right, that you've really you've discussed all those things with your clients, and they they end up making their own choices just with the right sort of guidance. Yeah, I mean, you, there's a few things we start on uh, licensees, but now we're moving on like actual recommendations. You know, something that you said is, well, I'm just helping my clients make their own decisions. Where I'd kind of challenge that because don't we as advisors, we all bring our own biases um, to the conversation. So even though we say 
we, we let the clients, um, you know, make their own decisions. We coach them in a certain way. If an advisor's got a bent towards, you know, property is the best thing or, or if, if you're Clayton Daniels, or Clayton Daniel even, um, and and super Thank is the you. best way that you could do, and you should put pump all the money into super. Um, you've got it. We've got a bent and a bias as advisors, so uh, we, you know we can't necessarily wash our hands clean and say, "Well, I'm just a coach." They've made the decision. Yeah, look, I, comple- I completely agree. Like there, we definitely, we as advisors, we have our own philosophies uh, and biases. I know. You know, the onus does need to, the people need to understand that. And I suppose that's the, the conversation that we have with clients. Like before I, before I agree to work with a client, I'll run them through what our philosophies are so that they can understand that. Uh, and then help we tell them about how the, how our advice process works, that we, that we help them with those decisions. But, you know, I suppose when you, uh, the clients need to make a call at some point because otherwise they're just floating in this sea of information that's, that's out there. Uh, and getting no closer to their goals. But, um, you know, even when you've got a bias, like, I, for example, in our business, we do almost entirely index investing for, for all of our clients. Uh, and I, obviously, I've, I've got, a, you know, a, a bent towards that, but I help clients understand, you know, this is what an index fund is. This is how it works. This is what the alternatives are. Um, this is what we think. And this is what we've seen. And this is what the information that backs up what we're saying. You know, do you understand that? Are you comfortable with that? The alternative would be to go to, you know, go use an active fund and then, um, you know, obviously it's something that I don't follow, but uh, go down that path. They're aware of that. But, yeah, I agree. They are guided by you, but I I think it's hard to escape that without giving guidance because that's what we're doing, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. And so... Yeah, and I mean, we had a discussion in the Facebook group around index investing and just within that Facebook group, there was 10 different advisors with, you know, different discussions around, you know, how they think and how they feel. And, you know, presumably we all we all run a very similar business, but we've all got biases just in one small aspect of advice. So that's a really interesting kind of discussion point uh, when we're talking about recommendations or SOAs, um, just, just our biases that we bring. But let's not get bogged down into that. We all kind of recognize technology is a massive, uh, disruptor. Um, uh, we all, I'm, I'm super bullish on technology. I think technology will, will and can wipe out our industry. Um, and so that's why I'm going to bring Naomi and you wrote an article last year after your U S uh, study tour. You said so- it's called software's eating the world. Um, so if you want to get worried about your business, um, anyone who's watching, read that article because <laughs> Naomi said clients attitude towards money is fundamentally different. Uh, much of this is to do with digitization and of how it's altered all facets of everyday lives. So from midwinter's point of view, uh, how do you see advisors utilizing technology uh, to move beyond the SOA or do you just think we're all doomed and we're going to be eaten up by software? <laughs> okay, there's probably a couple parts to that question. First of all, I'll say I don't, I don't think you're all doomed. Um, but I, I would say unless, um, unless you adapt to the way that the world's changing, uh, your value proposition may become defunct. Um, but as long as, uh, and I, I would... I would say our group uh, and the people in our group are pretty forward thinking. I think as long as you keep up with the trends, then you'll be fine. Um, From a midwinter perspective, uh, I think that, first of all, we want to, we know you you have to do an SOA. um, And when you do have to do an SOA, you don't want it to take a lot of time. So you want to be able to free yourself up to do the more important uh, client engagement bits with with your client, which I think is becoming uh, the more important value piece to uh, the new generation of advice seekers. Uh, They see you more as a money coach or I suppose that person they can go to to be the center of their financial universe. So um, Midwinter wants to make sure, and and many software companies probably just want to make sure that you can get that SOA done quickly and efficiently. That's the first part. Um, I think the second part is that um, technology companies want to or we should be, uh, the good ones should be, and are um, providing you with more than just pure SOA generation and modeling. They, they should be providing you with client engagement tools that allow you to 
give your clients advice on their terms. So as I said in that article, the way um, at people's attitude to mon money has fundamentally changed. The way we interact has changed. Um, Westpac Bank on um, Martin Place used to be the busiest bank by transaction. Now it's the 333 bus from Bondi um, Beach to the city because everyone um, does transactions on these. Nobody um, wants to go into the bank to do those simple transactions anymore. We've digitalized the way that we um, that we interact with money um, and advisors sort of need to, I guess, move on with that as well. So there are going to be things that your clients want to do from their phone or from their computer or the simple transactions that they want to just play around with themselves and then come and see you face to face for the serious things, the same way that you would go into a bank when you're about to get a home loan or you would go into a bank if you're about to switch home loans or a variety of different things like that. So I think um, if technology companies can be providing advisors with those tools to help engage their clients digitally for the simple pieces of advice, or at least be able to allow them to have conversations with their clients at scale, uh, then they're on the right track. Uh, the third thing, which I know that Patty will be nodding in agreement with me when I say, um, is making sure that uh, your technology that you're providing is open API. So if you can't integrate with other technologies, then uh, you can pretty much consider yourself uh, to be out of business in a couple of years time because advisors want choice and they want to use different pieces for different things. And if you can't speak, if your software can't speak to the other piece of software that an advisor is using, then it will eventually become useless. So um, advisors need software that can speak to each other. Um, as a technology company, I think it, that's the way that we can help advisors creating software that's open architecture. Does that answer everything? Yeah, so I mean, Patty, you love automation. You're all over Zapier. Don't give us a spiel about Zapier, please. But <laughs> do you think- I'll get that article out next week. Do you think technology is gonna take over our industry and, and we're gonna be out of a job? Uh, technology is, I reckon it's almost the saviour of all our pain points to an extent. Um, like a lot of a lot of practices have been moving down the lower cost route and getting outsourcing solutions, going overseas, things like that, um, which which does things to a certain extent. But it's just it's actually just working within an efficient system and just reducing the cost base of delivering. The issue is the the system and the process of how advice is done um, is the issue. To the larger issue because like as we were talking about before the SOA doesn't really deliver any value to a client um, in itself as a document um, and the way it's packaged up in most licensees um, so it doesn't deliver any value internally to an advice practice either because all the research that goes into that is actually already documented and, and on our system and we've saved it all already so if you look at it, our basis for advice is already there before the SOA is done the client's not going to um, understand what the SOA um, has in it, 50 to 100 pages or whatever, um, and the way it's communicated a lot of the time. Um, and every advisor pretty much has to um, communicate around that and use different ways to um, describe things to clients. Um, the issue isn't um, that the, the stuff that we actually do for the advice, like a good example before was what Clay, the example of Clay, Clay saying, oh, yep, add more in a super sort of thing. Like the, what we have to do, um, do for that is, is a shitload of work. And it doesn't make any sense for the benefit to the client. The cost of doing that almost defeats the purpose of actually us even opening our mouths because we have to charge for our, us to deliver that. So this is where technology comes in and um, it's, it's just automating things and getting things more seamless. Like for example, I guess you, the open architecture piece that Naomi was talking about, what, what that's as a basis for just everyone going forward, that, that is how you're going to future-proof how you go forward because Midwinter's doing their best, um, x -Plan Coin, all, they're, all, they're all doing things. I don't know if they're all doing their best, but they're all doing things that are trying to make the process easier, but a lot of it's, it's still a gradual thing and they can't all do it at once. They've only got so many resources, so there's going to be people that are doing different things. And midwinter is not going to be able to do everything, so it's important to be able to incorporate other other things in your process that take away um, take away um, administration tasks that you your staff don't need to be doing, you don't need to be doing. And uh, yeah, so 
I don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that technology will just take away from admin tasks. But Benny, you've got you've got some ideas around technology. Just give us an idea of what you're thinking. Yeah, look, I, well, just to add to what Adrian was saying there, like I, I think that it doesn't matter who your licensee is or what your um, your SOA looks like. It's still the SOA itself still doesn't add value. You know, like I. I gave Synchron a big rap before. Wealth Network are, are, are very similar in this area that, you know, we've got a very streamlined statement of advice where even for a really complex, like multiple strategies and, you know, different bits and pieces sort of uh, moving parts, it's still a 30-page document and, and really the, there is no value in the document. It's like Adrian said, all the research is done, the strategy work is done. When, when, um, when I work with our clients at Pivot, we have this strategy session before we get to the advice, before we start working on the statement of advice where we guide the clients through, you know, we, we do this uh, financial modelling and talk them through the output of the modelling, but then help them understand the strategies that sit, sit behind that, you, you know, the overall financial plan. And we run them through each area, sort of like, uh, like you, you sort of do in a statement of advice where, you know, this is how it works. But, in real language that people can understand. I draw some terrible pictures on the whiteboard and uh, help them understand how it all fits together, what the advantages and disadvantages are, what the alternatives are, and make sure that they're, they're comfortable with that. And they effectively uh, are signing off effectively on all of the strategies that go into the statement of advice before they even end up in the statement of advice. Then we have another meeting and we go through the statement of advice because we have to, like we have to provide it. They have to sign it. We want them to understand as much as they can. But really, it's a it's a burden on our business to to have to do that element when the, the clients have already understood that. You know, we have our strategy meetings go anywhere from sort of two and a half to four and a half hours with clients, and that uh, is also a very time consuming exercise in our business. But it's very necessary, and the reason we implemented that whole meeting was to help clients to make sure that they're you know comfortable with all the recommendations and how it's all fitting together and those sorts of things i know that it obviously becomes difficult to sort of uh you know um, put a compliance framework around that but uh, i would still argue that the the actual document that comes out the back is uh, is or you know is not a value add to anyone and certainly a big cost on advice businesses and something that adds a cost to the um, to the cost of us helping our clients. Yeah. Um, everyone watching, uh, we want this to be as kind of interactive as possible. So we'd love to hear your questions and feedback. I'm trying to curate it as best as I can. Um, but my question, I think I'll, I'll throw it over to uh, Clayton. Do you think uh, that we'll have an AFSL licensed advisor who never generates and produces an SOA for a client? Oh, for sure. Definitely. Um, that, that, that's, I think that'll definitely happen. Um, and, and, and there's absolutely points to being an advisor. Um, the moment I wasn't an advisor, I was like, shit, I really wish I was an advisor. Like, <laughs> that I spent so long thinking that the term was um, uh, tainted that uh, as soon as I stepped away from it, I thought, no, that's actually if I was to try and build an income from, you know, coaching or something, uh, not being an advisor, I think you're going to struggle. I think you're really going to struggle. So um, staying an advisor absolutely has its points. Even if we get annoyed with the term sometimes, I think it does have, have value in the market. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely see. I mean, so, for example, the other day I, I, found, I met this advisor. He has four clients. And uh, that, you know, those clients just are minted um, and he has them all on, um, you know, managed discretionary accounts and his paperwork was essentially negligible, right? So he, he was able to manage four portfolios relatively easy without any statements of advice, um, you know, and, and a an occasional maybe ROA or something like that, but it, it was really easy for him. So, uh, I mean... I would say that already exists. Um, what I would be interested in seeing is if someone could be an advisor without being an advisor. So your question was, could someone be an advisor and never give statements of advice? I want to, I would like to see if someone could actually be an advisor 
and not give any product advice while they weren't an advisor. I think that's even, I reckon that would be even harder to do. Yeah, so that was going to be my following question. If you're not providing an SOA, mm -hmm. is there a point of being a licensed advisor, an AR? Yeah, well, uh, yeah, luckily I preempted that question and answered it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, what, what do you guys think? Benny, do you think, you're in, you know, if, if technology takes over the world, Naomi's sorted, she's with Midwinter, Clayton doesn't care, he, he's given up on financial advice. Um, <laughs> Benny, Adrian and me, we're the ones got to deal with, you know, trying to make a buck in this, in this industry. Um, <laughs> do you think, do you ever see yourself, um, you know, providing a coaching service and not providing an SOA or do you think that that needs to happen always? Yeah, look, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I, I've been working with a client recently uh, who's based in Singapore and she's a referral from one of my clients over here. And uh, we're taking her through the process and we, we spent a lot of time, you know, working with her on a cash flow, um, understanding, you know, I, I, I obviously I can't, I don't know how the system exactly works in Singapore or what products may or may not be suitable. But um, so what I did when I was working with her is I, I coached her through the whole process helped us sort of formulate a strategy, but then relied on her to, to execute on the product side of things. Um, and and, and what, what I did through that was that I, I gave her a framework to do her research. So when we were looking at bank accounts, you know, I said we wanted her to have six different bank accounts, so we would needed to make sure that there were no fee bank accounts. We helped her understand that we didn't need necessarily want to have minimum transaction amounts, which is a common thing over there. Um, and those sorts of things. And, and together we sort of, we build out this strategy. Now we did that. We also uh, did some investment, uh, some invest uh, coaching around investments because that was part of her strategy. But again, I, I don't know how the, the Singapore landscape works or what products might be suitable there. So I, I again, lean back on the client to figure out, you know, some things within a, a certain framework. And when I got to the end of our, I, I follow the same process. So we have a four meeting process that we go through with our clients. And when I got to the, to after the third session and we'd set the strategy the the next one would be our, our statement of advice. But when I went to do it, really the only thing that, that was product advice that went in that, that I was working through with the client was that she, she wasn't used to be, uh, she is an Australian citizen and used to live here, had an old super fund, uh, actually had two super funds and we talked about consolidating the super into one fund and then adjusting she was young so adjusting to a uh, to a high growth investment within her existing super fund that she had over here um, the funny thing is what well, when I was doing the you know the the statement of advice and figuring out what I would put in there that was really the only thing now what I ended up doing was putting a you know, a broad strategy in, in place and really just some discussion notes around, you know, the cash flow strategy and the investment strategy and using our standard sort of statement of advice framework, but it probably wasn't necessary. Uh, and I think that if, if, you know, she had not had that Australian super fund, then there, there would have been no need at all for a, for a statement of advice. So, um, mm. yeah, I, I think that more, more, you know, especially if we can, uh, product providers can innovate and come to the party and have sort of off-the-shelf solutions that are going to help with uh, the, the sorts of things that we need to, to help our clients in the way that we want to. Yeah, it's going to be so much easier to help just coach people through the whole process. And, um, you know, that's a massive reduction in the compliance burden on a financial advice business. And, and it, it, as a result, should, should flow through to a cost reduction for clients, I think uh, over time. So I think absolutely that's a good thing. Um, uh, it's, I suppose that though the, the compliance element I I is important because as you say, you know, you mentioned before, and I don't know the answer to how this is managed, but we all come with our bi biases, but mm. you can effectively coach someone down a potentially the wrong path. You know, what does that, what does that mean? And I suppose that's a, that's a question that somebody's going to have to answer. I'm glad it's not me. Um, I mean, I guess an, an argument for that is that uh, that happens all the time, every single day with general advice anyway. Banks are giving general advice and or product providers are giving the general advice um, and leading them towards their biases anyway. So okay. Mark, Mark's um, got a, a, a question statement saying that um, 
uh, what do you say? If we just do, if we just do this strategy and didn't recommend a product that a client can use to put in place a plan in action, uh, many plans won't get implemented. So unfortunately, the SLA is needed for that. What do you think about that, Adrian? I think you need something that documents what you're going to do, but it doesn't have to be how it is, the format it is in now. Um, and I guess the other thing I wanted to throw in there is that. You sort of, if you think about best interest duty now, a lot of that hasn't really played out and there hasn't, ASIC's been a bit distracted and there hasn't sort of been direct action taken around how that's interpreted, what are the reasonable expectations for an advisor. And a lot of that stuff, I, I believe, is actually not going to have anything to do with SOA compliance. It's actually going to, they're going to start to look at what is a reasonable recommendation of advice for a client in that situation. And that's the sort of stuff they're going to look at. And you can do as much compliance as you want. Um, you can have the best documentation in the world and you can have all your file notes. But if you've done something that is completely inappropriate and the client wasn't on necessarily completely on board on, then you're still screwed. Like we are all personally liable now as advisors. So that's what Clayton doesn't have to worry about actually. So think about that, Clay. That's, that's, a, that's one on your side. Um, it just, I just don't think it's actually been... Um, it's not quite, it hasn't evolved that, that um, legislation hasn't filtered through yet and in the advice and the accounting space yet. So I think it's a bit of watch this space and see how that's interpreted. And maybe we'll get these changes that we're sort of talking about today because maybe they'll just go remove, they'll make a direct ruling and go like the SOA cannot be longer than four pages. It actually has to just be a document that says stuff as simply as possible. Um, but I wanted to point out something in terms of the technology piece and uh, like a lot of things like Midwinds is working on the straight through processing and that's really cool. And there's, there's all these little bits and pieces and it's about product providers working with technology to give them the data they need and the interface they need to then get um, products implemented. Because we're always going to need some sort of um, some sort of product if you're talking about superannuation and the way it's enshrined in a trustee structure and it's unitized, that's, it's, a, it's innately a product. So there's no getting away from that. So you have to interface with that product somehow and the most efficient, effective way that we can do that, then that, that's gonna make it easier for us. So I guess my point that I was saying before around keeping open architecture and just designing everything you do in a way where as technology comes along, you can plug it into how you're doing things and stay adaptable that's that's my number one tip in terms of how things um things are rolling phil i was gonna i was gonna actually segue into um i know you wanted to talk about sort of um like like we're all talking about advisors but the people that support us do you mind if i segue into that i've got in terms of um Patty, if I could control what you did and said <laughs> I, I i would love that but i'm not going to so go for it buddy <laughs> um, so it just sort of links up with my philosophy around what staff members are needing to know. Like it, with all the change that's going on and like we don't know what technology we're going to be using in the next year um, because there's so much cool stuff coming out gradually. Um, what, what my, I'm starting to really change the way I think around how staff and their strengths and what they need to be good at as opposed to what we traditionally look at, and I still look at now when I'm looking at stuff, is their ability to follow a process administration. What we're gonna need people to do if, if we don't, so we don't have to do it, is adapt to all the technology and manage the technology and bring it together because there's not gonna be one centralized solution for what we're gonna need because advice is so complex and it's so broad. So that's sort of my take on where our, the support for advisors is gonna go in terms of people that can handle different types of technology and know how to interface it together and know how to orchestrate it in an advice sort of style. Yeah, I, don't, I actually don't subscribe to that theory at all. I think technology will in turn take over almost everything we do apart from uh, the one-on-one -on -one relationship with the, we have with clients. And the clients who want that will opt into that and the clients who don't want that will get the same uh, services products um, without that kind of uh, assistance from us. Um, but before you keep hijacking the conversation, Patty, 
Uh, I'm going to go around to everyone um, and we'll probably have this question on the Facebook group as well. So if you're not on the Facebook group, um, what are you doing with yourselves? You look yourself in the mirror, as we like to say, at XY Advisor uh, and jump on the Facebook group. But the, my last question that I'll get everyone to ask uh, or, or answer even um, is what uh, should financial advice look like in five years' time? So we'll start with you, Patty. I um, actually sat, I got invited to sit down with Zurich and a futurist uh, the other week and uh, it was a pretty interesting session. We are sort of unpacking a whole lot of um, themes and advice and where things are going and we broke out in the groups and I came back. Uh, one of the ideas that my group came up with is that Facebook will actually design people's objectives for them and they just have to so you might just tick a tick a button in um, in Facebook, and it'll it'll say this is this is what you this is your life. We've got so much data on you. We can read your face when you're doing certain activities. We know what you're enjoyed. So we're going to sprinkle a bit of travel in there. We're going to sprinkle a bit of this, and this is how it's this is your strategy for your lifestyle. And then all you need to do is plug in your finances, which that might just be another tick box, and they'll um, give you a plan on how to achieve it with your current financial situation, and your earnings, and. That's your plan done. And if they're nice, they might let us plug into it and be like a, a Facebook coordinator or something where we might talk to clients about what Facebook's come up with and maybe tweak it or something. So do you think that's what it's going to look like in five years' time or have you gone on another tangent? Oh, I just think that's potentially the, the amount of technology and the artificial intelligence out there. I'm, I'm coming back to what you were saying, Phil. It's, it's definitely possible, mate. I was, I was just sort of thinking outside the box. The amount of information they have on people, it's um, something that could yeah, happen. Um, Patty, I'm intentionally being a bit rude. Uh, I apologise. Oh, just in case what, Who is his jerk? Um, that's, just, that's just how we roll. Um, so, Naomi, question to you. What do you think uh, advice will look like in five years' time? Yeah, look, um, I was just reading the comments and I, I tend to agree with um, Stuart Barber's last comment in terms of how I think advice will look like in five years. I think uh, like personal training or like hairdressing, I think it will be that there'll be a lot of this stuff that people can do themselves. I mean, people can go to the gym and train themselves. They can go on Google and research everything, um, every workout, every... Um, muscle that needs training and they can do it themselves but they don't because they need help um, and I think the same with hairdressing you can go to a chemist and buy a, a packet dye and put it on yourself but a lot of people don't because they'd rather someone who knows better does it for them um, I think advice in five years will look a little bit more like that instead of now where it still looks very investment-y and producty and um, something for I guess people that have a lot of money um, instead, it will be something um, that anyone at any stage of their finances and at any age can go and see someone to get money help. Um, and I really do hope that's the way it goes because the reason we have 20 only 20% of Australians receiving financial advice is the branding it has at the moment. So when that brand shifts um, to give advisors the um, uh, reputation of being people that will just help you with your money rather than um, people that sit at a computer and uh, click a couple of things and look at numbers and um, invest in this and do that, um, then then you'll really get a shift of the amount of people that want to come and use your services. So that's kind of where I see it uh, going in five years' time, hopefully. All right, Clayton, what do you think advice will look like in five years' yeah so a few uh big finance companies have recently completely tapped out of financial advice uh, i can't remember which one's off the top of my head but um with cba getting into a lot of trouble with their financial advice um and i think what's going to happen is a royal commission is going to come in at some point um and i think i think a lot of the big instos are gonna um just get whipped um at that stage, I hope that something like an AFSL is just eradicated. I think things like an AFSL are the source of a lot of problems. Um, and I, I hope, I mean, if we can get to there without a Royal Commission, excellent. But if it takes a Royal Commission to get rid of the AFSL, so be it. I, I would like to see in five years' time the, the AFSL is gone. Um, and awesome products that are offering a lot more than, 
hey, dump your super over here and then here's your um, insurance. I hope they exist and and I anticipate that they will, especially with technology. Um, I differ with, um, or maybe I just don't quite understand what you're saying, Phil, but I definitely disagree with the concept that technology will... um, Oh, wait, first I'll clarify. Phil, are you saying that everything will get done by the advisor, but it would just be done automatically by technology and then the the advisor just handles the relationship? Uh, so this wasn't necessary in relation to a five-year time frame. No, uh, I realise that. Yeah, yeah. So for me, well, all right, here we go. Uh, for me, I feel like uh, technology will take over a lot of stuff we're doing. Uh, Dylan said, well, underwriting and personal insurance recommendations can't be done by a computer. Fundamentally disagree. Like, what do we do? We give some insured recommendation and we send it to a, an insurance company to do underwriting. That can well, there's already all- underwriting uh, technology now. Uh, yeah, there is. It's not as sophisticated, but, no. you know, just get one company doing full underwriting, just do a pinprick of uh, your bloods, you know, have a tracker on your wrist for a day and uh, look at your bank accounts and that's underwriting. They'll know far more information about you and the health risks that you, that you have now than they currently do with a with a hundred word, you know, a hundred question questionnaire. So I think those type of solutions will come about and us as an advisor, we'll have a relationship with the client. I still think we'll be able to charge a fee for that, but I don't think we'll give product recommendations. I think we'll say, go to this provider who will give you the product recommendations for insurance, super, this, that. Uh, they'll tell you what sums insured you should get. They'll pretty much do all the work and we'll just be money coaches. Okay, so I, 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 I'd probably, I agree with a, a lot of it, but yeah, I definitely just, I think they'll still get the recommendations from people because money's so emotional, because it's not rational, because, be, and I think that's the big mistake that Silicon Valley made is they're like, oh, here's Betterment and Wealthfront and now it's cheaper and now it's better. And everyone was just like, nah, because it, it was just focused on that technical and rational piece because money is so emotional. I think uh, going to what Naomi said, we can, we, we could absolutely create the technology for, for recommendations to be done, but, um, and we can go to the chemist to get the hair dye. But I think at the end of the day, even though we've all got tilts and we've all got, um, you know, um, biases, if people like you as the person, they probably want that bias. So mm. if, if, I, if I call up or go on the internet or whatever, even talk with an artificial piece of intelligence, I'm not going to have an emotional connection with that. So I don't care if they give me the cheapest, best thing for me because it's so important. I'll probably prefer to go see you and you can give me your tilts and you like 130% up front and I'm willing to pay it. I, I, I still think we're going to be in a, in a job. Don't get, well, the good advisors will be in a job. I still think, uh, irrespective of your 130% comment. <laughs> no, I'm being facetious there, but you get my I point. Don't, I don't think that uh, we, I think as an industry, I mean, we're going off on a massive tangent, but I think as an industry, we're so arrogant to think that we hold the cards. We're so important to our clients' minds. I think we are important to our clients' minds, but as an industry, we say we can never be replaced, um, which I think is just arrogant. Um, And so I think technology will take a large portion of our grunt work, which Adrian did mention it before, and I think that's where we play. Uh, we play in u- understanding and utilizing technology to take away our grunt work and coaching clients. Um, but taking the example of Betterment and, and those uh, robo advice uh, solutions in the US, they didn't succeed because they fundamentally gave nothing different than a cheaper product. They were just asset allocation. That's all they were. There was nothing, there was no coaching involved. But the more AI comes in, the more computers are smarter and better at actually coaching us um, and using big data, then they will get better then they will actually start taking away our jobs. But we are off on a massive tangent and I'd like to have the last word in that discussion, Clayton. Um, But we didn't get to Ben. So Ben, uh, what should advice look like in five years' time? Uh, Yeah, look, I I think I tend to agree with a lot of the things that are are being said there. But uh, I, for once, I agree with you in that um, the 
the advisors will, will like they can automate a lot of these things, but I see the, there will still be a role for an advisor, which is sitting in the centre and pulling the strings with the tech and helping people use which you choose the right tech interfaces to figure out their insurance needs or to figure out their underwriting or figure out their cash flow or their investments or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, when these tech solutions exist, they the solutions will have their bias. So I think that there's still a role to help someone cut through the noise because it's like you need a, what are you going to have, like a tech to choose your tech, right? That is still a role in, in coordinating as a project manager. Uh, and I think that people, it's good to have someone to, to work with, you know, keep you accountable and also to blame. And that's why I think that a lot of these robo um, investment things fail because when the markets went down in America, when we saw shortly after the massive blow up of, of how they were all doing really successfully, that people didn't, they, they were just relying on the computer. They see their investments going down and they think, oh, the computer's made a mistake and then they pull their money out. That's a bad outcome for the client. So um, good to have someone there. Um, and the other thing that I think w w is a critical role for an advisor, now I don't know how far technology will go, but when I look at, at the clients that I work with, there, there's a lot of people with very different personalities. Uh, and I think that some people need, uh, some people you can just, you know, be brief and um, scan and they're happy to sort of uh, follow your processes. Other people need a lot more, you know, information and coaching and, and to help them get comfortable and, 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 and be, be ready to move forward. Um, and as, as, I don't know who that was before, maybe Nobby or, um, Stuart possibly, but to help people actually take action and move forward as well. You know, like, uh, as I said, I don't know how far the tech can go, but there's massive value, not just in having a plan. The plan is half the battle. Um, having a good plan is, 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 is half the battle, but then you need a system and you need accountability and you need someone to push you forward because that's where you get the benefits. No one gets any benefit out of a financial plan. They get benefits out of taking the action that's in a financial plan. So I think, I think there's a role there. But I don't know, maybe Watson will surprise me. Who yeah. knows? All right. I think that's a, a facilitated a really good discussion. We'd love to hear uh, what you think of this. If you think, uh, shut up, guys. I don't want to hear from anyone else. I just want to see you interviewing someone and I just want to hear from them because I really don't care what Adrian thinks about Zapier. I'm sick of hearing Clayton, um, you know, waffle on about how advice is doomed, but then he wants to get back into advice. Um, <laughs> and so... We'd love to hear your feedback. We're going to um, move this over to Facebook. So please, uh, if you're not there, join Facebook group. Um, and I reckon it'd be a really good discussion um, to uh, kick off uh, what should advice look like in the next five years. And we can kind of move our questions and our disagreements, our agreements over to Facebook uh, because we've got a really kicking um, community over in Facebook. So thank you, everyone. Um, remember... Uh, we've got an event on the 30th of March, XY Social. So taking uh, Beyond the SLA into a live setting. I'm flying up to Sydney. So if you're in Perth, no excuses. Brisbane, Melbourne, Adelaide. I'm uh, not going to mention every state. But wherever you are, fly to Sydney. Uh, we're all going to stay at Paddy's house. So uh, free <laughs> and just It's on the water at Coogee. <laughs> um, all the barrier. Uh, uh, I'll step in here and say, um, I, I don't know if we've announced it yet, but I, I, I will announce now that we're giving away um, a copy of Clay's book to everyone who comes to the event. So uh, you'll, you'll definitely be leaving with something of value if, um, if not from hearing from him, Mia and Mark. So that's fantastic. And thank you to our partners for the event. They make really good paperweights. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, um, everyone, for coming. And just want to say a massive thanks to AIA for supporting XY Live uh, and helping us put it on. Uh, they've been a huge support. And Mel Crawford at uh, AIA has been super supportive of what we're doing. So I just want to thank AIA. And thank you all for coming. And let us know what you think. Thanks, guys. Bye.